good evening, everyone, and welcome tonight to tonight's session with Maria Chaudhuri on the heart of memoir, the interior journey, the power of imagery, and memory versus absolute truth. Um, just to introduce Maria, Maria lives in Hong Kong, but she's originally from Bangladesh, and she grew up there until she moved to the United States for university. In 2009, while she was living in Japan, she completed her MFA in creative writing at Goddard College in Vermont. As part of her MFA, Maria worked on Beloved Strangers, a memoir that was published by Bloomsbury last year. Um, Beloved Strangers was picked as one of Vogue's top 10 books to look out for in 2014. A review in the Boston Globe said, the brilliance of this big-hearted book is in its acceptance, clear-eyed but without bitterness, of all the sad tales that make up her own. Beloved Strangers is a memoir, but what struck me personally was how much it read like a novel, and I think we'll talk a little bit about that tonight. Um, Maria writes about her childhood, um, school, family, a failed marriage, and kind of both cross-cultural and cross-generational issues and misunderstandings. The title, Beloved Strangers, comes from her relationship with her parents, and there's tension throughout the book, stems from the complexities of tradition and religion, independence and coming of age. There's a theme of separation, um, and actually, I think the book begins with three stories of separation, including on page two, where she already wants to run away. So um, for me, the novelistic treatment of the memoir is what really made it stand out, and it's something I'm interested about hearing more tonight. Maria has been a featured speaker at festivals such as the Jaipur Literary Festival, and tonight she joins us to speak about memoir, the ups and downs of writing, and of course, any questions you guys might have about writing or being published out of Hong Kong. I thought we might start off tonight with having uh, Maria read an excerpt from Beloved Strangers. Maria? Yeah. Hello. Hi, everyone. Good evening, uh, Maria. And thank you so much for coming out tonight. This is usually the time of the day when I'm the most exhausted, so you guys must be feeling the same way. So thank you for, for coming out. Um, Melanie, thank you for the introduction that, you know, should probably give you some idea of what the book is about. But um, I'll just, uh, you know, if I were to just uh, sum it up in a sentence or two, which is always the hardest part for me, it's much harder than actually writing a book, is uh, this book is about a woman who comes into wisdom and, um, and womanhood, both within and without the, the confines of um, her family, um, of, of a household that is that is loving, but at the same time claustrophobic. Uh, this book is a reflection on belonging and dispossession, on love and separation, as Melanie said, and um, on leaving and, and returning. So I'll start with a passage uh, from the first chapter. It's called, uh, the first chapter is called Saving Grace. And this passage is um, actually... Um, Many of you may or may not know that this actually uh, this month is actually the month of Ramzan, which is the, the holy month of fasting for Muslims all over the world. So I thought I might pick this passage because it's actually a scene, a typical scene in a Muslim household, which is the kind of household that I grew up in, in the month of Ramzan. Uh, my family and I are seated around um, the table uh, partaking uh, the meal called Sehri, which is the pre-dawn meal uh, right before you start the day of fasting. So it'll give you a good sort of insight into the cultural backdrop of both my family and, my relig and the kind of religious traditions I come from as well as um, give you uh, an idea of how I responded to, or rather rebelled against such uh, norms. Okay. The month of Ramzan, which follows the cycle of a new moon, appeared at slightly different times each year. During the holy month of Ramzan, explained my father, we were going to pledge our allegiance to God by fasting from dawn to dusk, cleansing ourselves of our deepest desire, the desire to eat and therefore perhaps to live. At the end of the day, we could rejuvenate ourselves by celebrating the very desire we renounced all day. I see now a blurry logic in the simultaneous renouncement and celebration of life, a roundabout attempt to affirm the entirety of the life and death cycle by invoking them in turn. 
The year I turned 15, Ramzan fell in July, the hottest month of the year. School was out, but there was no escape from the blistering heat. When we woke to eat sehri, the pre-dawn meal, Amol would place pitcher after pitcher of ice-cold water on the table, which vanished before he had a chance to turn his back. The old ceiling fan blew nothing but hot air, and even the mosquitoes were too sluggish to drink our salt-drained blood. In that heat, it was impossible to digest Amol's flaming curries and sizzling grilled meats. So my mother poured cold milk over our rice and threw in chopped bananas to make a sticky mixture. Sitting in the semi-darkness with our assortment of sweet milk and banana rice, curries, kebabs, and ghee-soaked parathas, my family devoutly prepared for the day ahead. As soon as the sun started to appear in the eastern sky, illuminating the shapes of trees and buildings, I desperately tried to gulp down one last glass of water. Hurry, my mother often prompted. When the Maulana starts the morning prayer, prayer call, you have to stop eating and drinking. Nonsense, my grandmother snapped. It's not the prayer call that matters. As long as there isn't enough light to see the hair on your own body, you can keep eating. It made me wonder about those who did not have enough body hair to begin with. My grandmother had practically hairless limbs, making her sip her second cup of tea as calmly as a Buddha, while the rest of us scrambled to finish our meals. Something happened to me that year. Something dislodged and broke away somewhere deep inside my cells, leaving a gluttonous gaping hole. It left me breathless and impatient. It left me standing in the midday sun, throwing stones at the crows that came to scrounge scraps of food from the small veranda next to the kitchen. Sweat stuck to my skin and clothes like honey, leaving me so parched I felt I could drink water out of a toilet bowl. I found myself walking to the kitchen every so often to get a whiff of iftar, the delectable evening meal that a molar cook prepared for the uh, breaking of fast. My mind kept worrying around the images of spicy red dal, marinated and fried to crispiness, black peas curried with onions and tomatoes, and the deliciously caramelly Mecca dates imported specially for Ramzan. Being Christian, our cook Amol didn't observe Ramzan, and I hovered around him, finding twisted consolation in watching him eat his meals. His breakfast of sugared milk with thickly buttered chapati, for lunch, generous portions of fried fish, rice, and fresh cool salads of coriander, tomatoes, and cucumber. During Ramzan, my father usually came home early from work. He'd stack his briefcase neatly under his desk, change into a clean white kurta, a white topi on his head, and quietly settle into his favorite chair, prayer beads in hand. I was disconcerted by the serenity he exuded, the stillness in his posture. How could he look so content when all I could do was count the seconds till I doused the fire in my belly? To make matters worse, the terrible pangs of hunger were followed by terrible pangs of guilt. The whole point of fasting was to conquer the throes of hunger and desire, and every time I groaned or complained or thought about food, I fell from God's grace. So I gritted my teeth and plodded through the day, because heaven forbid, if I made my feelings known, I would fall from my father's grace as well. The desperate attempt to distract myself from my all-consuming hunger led me, one intolerable afternoon, to pick up the phone and call my friend Rakib. Half an hour later, we were sitting on the rooftop, gazing unsurely at the street below. I had always liked him, but why I had sought his company just then, and why, had he, why he had complied so easily, I did not know. Thoughts bubbled up to our lips, but starvation left us too exhausted to speak. In truth, words were useless right then. I clasped his hand in mine, more out of frustration than anything else. At the touch, our hunger flowed out of us with volcanic rage, sweeping everything else out of our way. Our bodies were so clammy we could barely slide our hands over each other's skin, but we clung to each other. Our kiss was deep and voracious, but also inexpert and unexciting. It was not a kiss that was born out of love or lust. It was a kiss born out of starvation and frustration. And yet we knew that fasting was supposed to give us a sense of spiritual fulfillment and purpose that would help us rise above the physical hardship of defeat. 
So where was it, that restorative feeling of salvation at the end of every blood-draining fast? I waited for it every day, and it didn't come. I tried to find it through that kiss, an act of defiance, a silent mutiny. I had hoped that by violating the rules of a fast, through engaging in any form of physical union, I could at least guilt my way back to being an unquestioning believer in its worth. But at the end of the long kiss, I was surprised by the rush of relief that swept over me. It was as if a high fever had broken, and, along with it, my delirium. By breaking the divinely ordained rules of fasting, I had unleashed a profound hunger, one that neither food nor flesh could satisfy. I began to understand that it was precisely this kind of hunger, this corroding, corrupting hunger, a hunger that turned us into untamed, untethered creatures that we were meant to curb and conquer through fasting. Thanks, Maria. Um, so I, I did want to ask, so Beloved Strangers is your, your first book, and it, it did come from doing an MFA, but can you tell us a little bit about how that story came to be, because were you originally, um, initially intending on writing a memoir, or...? Sorry, <laughs> I'll blame it on the pregnancy brain, please. Um, I'll answer the second part of the question first, which is, was it originally intended to be a memoir? Um, I would say initially, no. Um, initially, I did think about writing uh, it in the form of uh, some sort of uh, fiction, uh, an autobiographical fiction, if you will, because I knew that um, I always wanted to write this story. So an autobiographical fiction would have meant, you know, writing it in the form of fiction, but very similar scenarios and uh, situations that you see in the, in the memoir. But um, it didn't feel right once I started writing it that way. Um, I, I felt that there was a certain um, rawness, a certain kind of power missing in the prose that I wanted to bring to it. And um, that just isn't possible always with fiction, which um, with fi in fiction there's a certain distance between the, the writer and the subject, which has its advantages, but it just wasn't working for me or my book. So I, I decided pretty early on to switch the genre to, to memoir. And um, how did this book come to be? So that's, that's part of how it came to be. And um, I think the, the simplest and the truest answer is that this, this book was always inside me. Um, it is me. I, I see this book as a quest. Um, it's not really, um, you know, a book that sets out to provide answers or establish absolute truths. Um, it's a book that raises questions. Um, it looks at the crucial turning points in my life, for example, moving to the U.S., um, being pressurized to conform to, to religious behavior, um, not being allowed to sing, and it considers those um, those those facts, those things, and um, and uh, and muses on on who I would have been if things would have been different, and who I've become instead. Um, picking up on on that, kind of, can you speak a little bit more generally what what you think a memoir is? And you kind of mentioned absolute truth. So, how do you handle truth in in a memoir that is slightly different to what you know absolute truth is? Very simply put, a memoir is a, a collection of memories um, that you put, uh, that you outline into a, a story, into a narrative arc, so to speak, um, with, a, with a concrete beginning, middle, and end. Um, but, you know, absolute truth in memoir is, um, first of all, I don't know that there is any such thing as absolute truth, either in memoir or even in autobiography. Um, but having said that, I think absolute truth in memoir is impossible because memoir is, um, memories are uh, how you remember things after they have happened. So what you remember and how you remember them um, is bound to be faulty and it's bound to be different from someone else's perspective. So in that sense, um, I would say memoir is very much about truthful scenarios. Um, you can't just make up things um, as you do in, in fiction. Uh, you have to, uh, you know, write something that you 
believe you remember. That's how it happened. But how you remember it may be very different from how somebody else remembers it. So therefore, I think it's impossible to, to find absolute truth in memoir in that sense. In, in remembering something in a way that perhaps other people might not remember. So there's, you know, quite a few, you're in Beloved Strangers, it's about you, but it's also a lot about your family and your mother, for example, plays a quite a strong, she plays an important role. So when you were, when you were writing um, your book, how did you, was there, how did you consider, you know, what she might think if you were, you know, if you were to write this, Cause, because maybe she might remember something different to what you, you remembered in, in your writing? Oh, she did. Um, <laughs> she remembered everything differently. I, I had to face my demons, you know, um, which is why I think in the beginning I considered it to be a f work of fiction. Um, but I think, you know, at some point you realize in the writing process that the story is bigger than you. And the voice, um, you know, com the voice of the story, the voice that you're going to use in the story um, uh, it, it comes to you in a certain way. At least that's how it works for me. I don't have a concrete idea of where it's going to go until I've actually started writing it. And so, you know, the, the voice that was coming to me was very much the voice of a memoirist in the fir first person. And um, I knew I had to go that way. So, um, yes, I was very apprehensive in the beginning. Uh, one of the things that helped me was that, you know, I told my, my family knew I was, I was writing a book, a book. My mother knew I was writing a book, but I didn't really tell them what exactly I was writing. It helped that I was in graduate school and I was writing, yeah, she's writing something. So, you know, I uh, didn't want to talk about it while it was being written and that helped put some distance between me and the fears. But eventually I had to face them because, you know, it was going to be published. Um, and uh, no, my mother was not happy when it came out because, as I said, uh, as we just talked about absolute truth and remembering things differently, she remembered everything differently. <laughs> so um, we had to agree to disagree on a lot of things, uh, but I was, I was prepared for that, and I was lucky because eventually she came around. In, in the writing process, was there anything that you were hesitant to put in, or was there anything that you left out that you maybe in hindsight, might have put in? Um, I don't think I left out anything. I mean, I think, you know, it's, um, you can just go on writing. It's, it's your life and things keep happening. So, um, you know, the book could have been another 200 pages or it could have been a f another 50 pages less. So I don't think I left out anything. I think as far as the storyline goes, I put uh, whatever I um, thought was relevant to this particular narrative. Um, and in terms of, um, uh, what was the other part of your I question? Mean, I just kind of mean, was there anything, considering that you're writing about yourself, yeah. was there anything that you were nervous to put in or that sort of you knew needed to be part of the story but you were a little bit apprehensive to include? Um, I think what I was apprehensive about was more of not necessarily a certain scenario or a fact, but, you know, one of the things that you have to be careful about in, in memoir, one of the biggest struggles is that because you're writing something that is mostly your truth, you have to remain true to that. But at the same time, um, it kind of distorts the form if you are vindicating anybody in the process. So I think the biggest struggle, um, the, the push and pull is that you have to remain true to your story, your voice, your perspective, but at the same time you have to do it in as non-judgmental and non-vindictive a manner as possible. And I think I struggled with that throughout and hopefully, you know, have uh, done a good job of not being non-judgmental, uh, but that was one of the things that, yeah. Um, there's a lot of really vivid imagery in, in the book and in terms of memoir, I think we were discussing before that kind of memoir is nonfiction, but you treat it novelistically, or you have some novelistic techniques in there. What were some of those techniques that you, you used, and kind of how did you find being able to tell a story from your, your very personal voice, but using these techniques enable you to kind of tell the story that you, you wanted to and needed to? Yeah, I think that a good memoir has to read like a novel. Um, and it has to draw from the techniques of um, novel writing or fiction writing. And um, the way memoir can do that, because, you know, in novel, in, in 
in a novel you you pick up you you make your plot and you control the pace of the plot um, through action you can you can speed up the action you can slow down the action and there goes your plot it goes up and down and you create tension and all of that you don't have that um, you don't have that in memoir because you have to rely on things that actually happened and as we all know life is not always action packed so how do you how do you bring that sense of um urgency and intensity in memoir um you do that um you know basically um uh, through your emotional quest in other words and um i think um one of the the one of the main things that um set apart well i uh, no i wouldn't say set sets apart i think in novel you can also have um especially in character driven novels you have that that emotional quest um but i think the emotional quest is really the flesh and blood of 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 memoir um that's that's your reader's lifeline that's their hook into your story so that's what you have to hone in on and you have to do it in a novelistic manner so for example in memoir uh i um let's say i'm describing a scene where i'm being bullied by my schoolmates so i can play with the imagery here i can't play with the actual event that had to have happened to me i would have had to be bullied by my classmates um but i can play with the imagery in a very novelistic manner um bangladesh for example is always hot and sunny so i can play with metaphors that concern you know heat uh, hot weather or um the sun or whatever um i remember the i remember the general att- physical attributes and the personas of the the people who who bullied me so i can i can play with those um aspects of the scene um so it's it's about playing with imagery it's about drawing your characters and your scenarios um based on truth based on what happened but doing it in an imaginative way which is what we see in novels not fabricated but imaginative imaginative and in a stylized way i think memoir is stylized truth that's what it is when when you were talking about sort of this interior journey would you say you treated yourself as as a character in or were you always conscious that you know i'm writing about myself no i i definitely treated myself as a character i think you have to otherwise you i i mean again that's another novelistic part of of the memoir i think you everything everyone is a character otherwise it becomes more along the lines of an autobiography where you're just sort of pointing out facts and you know um kind of going off of autobiography and memoir sometimes there are some kind of misconceptions or people lump biography and memoir and autobiography together is do you feel that that sort of um i don't know not damaging but do you think that it does a disservice to to the art of memoir in any way yeah i would say disservice is the right word um you know i i auto memoir is autobiographical and a lot of people um exchange the terms autobiography and memoir and they use them interchangeably and i wouldn't go um i would say that i would go so far as to say that with some memoirs and autobiographies that's not necessarily a stretch i think that um they are both genres where you know the literary styles can overlap and uh it doesn't the writers of the autobiography or the memoir don't have to strict so adherently to a defini- uh, adhere so strictly to a definition so you can in some cases ad- uh, cha- uh, interchange um the definition but um i think for the purposes of understanding and clarity i think autobiography is um attempts or yeah autobiography is a greater attempt at at telling that absolute truth that we were talking about um given of course that there is no such thing as absolute truth i think autobiography is based on facts um it's um it gives a sort of historical account of the the person's life it should um uh, you know include things uh phases such as childhood adolescence um adulthood etc uh 
so the, the chronology or the timeline is very different for an autobiography versus a memoir. A memoir can simply be about one year of a person's life. It can be about one person. It could be about one event that happened to the memoirist and how she remembers that and how that has shaped her or what her emotional uh, response is to that. But uh, not so in an autobiography. So I would say two major differences. The, the facts are much more um, uh, objective in memoir and because they are as you remember and not really as they happened. And you don't have, that onus doesn't fall on you to do fact check and you know, given just exactly the things that you remember correctly, etc. Whereas in autobiography, you have to do that. And then the second main difference would be the timeline or the chronology. Um. In, in the book, you kind of, there's a lot of it that's set um, where you grew up, and then quite a lot of it is also set, you know, some of it's set in where you went to university in Massachusetts, but also in, in New York City. And then there's one passage where you write about feeling um, a certain homelessness, sort of, which I think maybe some people who have sort of similar backgrounds where they've moved around a lot um, might have, can relate to. Can you kind of describe what you mean by, by that sort of homelessness and sort of that relation to the theme of separation? Yeah, I think a lot of people in this room, just as I look around the different faces, can already relate to that term, homelessness. Um, in my book, I, you know, I, I talk about two different kinds of homelessness or two parts of homelessness that I felt happened and I enhanced or talked about in the memoir. Um, so I, I talk about two kinds of rootedness or lack thereof. The first rootedness is something that we all start out with and sort of retain in part or in full for the rest of our lives, which is the rootedness that we feel to our family and our home environment where we are born and brought up. Um, and, um, you know, the, the first, so the first separation or the first feeling of homelessness um, that I feel in the first part of the book, rather, is uh, this uh, alienation from, from the family, from the household environment. And that's more of the emotional homelessness that I talk about. And the, the second part of the book deals more with the physical, concrete sense of homelessness when I actually leave Bangladesh and go to the US when I'm 18 years old. And um, I've actually never been back since. Um, so um, uh, so it's, it's, it's a two-part kind of homelessness that I talk about. But, but at the end of the day, um, you know, I think it boils down to the same thing. I think it boils down to the, the feeling of not belonging, the feeling of being alienated from any specific community, really. Um, and then kind of just sort of switching topics a little. Y you, no from New York, you moved to Japan. And yes. that's where you did your, yes. your MFA. Um, well, I, I did it uh, in the US, but I was living in Japan. So I was sort of moving back and forth, yes. And then when you were in Hong Kong, you moved to Hong Kong, what, five years ago? Is that five and a half five years ago, yeah. And your book was picked up by Bloomsbury while you were living in Hong Kong. That's right. Um, and I, I wanted to ask a little bit about how you, you got the book published from, from Hong Kong with a major publisher. Yeah, so um, I uh, finished my graduate school while I was living in Japan. And then uh, shortly after that, my husband and I moved to, to Hong Kong. And, um, you know, I had, a, I had a baby. I had my first son. And I just sort of, um, you know, forgot about the book. I, I had written it, or at least the, I would say the, the initial framework, the, the actual book looks very different from what I had written uh, during my grad, grad school years. But anyway, I had something, and I'd forgotten about it, you know, how it goes when you have a baby. And then about a year later, I, um, I picked an excerpt from it, and I sent it to a Bangladesh-based uh, English literary journal. It's called Bengal Lights. It's an excellent journal. It's online. Check it out if you can. And um, I just sent an excerpt there. And um, as it so happened, an editor from Bloomsbury uh, picked up that journal and read the excerpt and called me. So um, I got very, very lucky. <laughs> And then, and then that, that so I actually much. didn't have to do anything in Hong Kong. I didn't have to, you know, sit here and send out query letters either to publishers here or abroad. Um, I just, you know, happened to be approached by a big publisher. Yes. You're welcome. 
are. Yes, it's, it's quite a fairy tale story. Um, when you know, in that publication process, was it challenging for you, sort of after the book came out, to um, be based here and sort of do all of the, the stuff around publication? Yeah, I would say that was the more challenging part, because um, you know, not. I mean, I would say a lot of the major English publishers or publishers of English books um, have some presence here in Hong Kong, but it's not very big. And, um, it, you know, it is, um, it's not exactly a, a, the, the kind of place where you can have a lot of post-publicity uh, presence or appearance once your book has uh, come out, uh, simply because, you know, there aren't enough English bookstores and the, the kind of English books that are uh, available here in bookstores are usually the, the mainstream books and uh, it's a small collection. So it's, um, it's a whole different story. Uh, so I think that was hard, but also, f um, also because my publisher is, um, is very big and they are you know a worldwide presence um, so i g that that helped me a lot because they they really did a, a good job of of promoting me even though i'm sort of sitting here in one very remote literary corner of the world right. and just my final question for you is what what are you what have, have you been working on or what are you working on these days um i have been working on napping and eating these days. <laughs> but I've also been working on some short stories. Um, and uh, I, yeah, I would say the short stories are mainly what I've been working on. I've done a little bit of work on a second book, but it really hasn't gone that far. And is that one a memoir as well? Or? No, oh, I don't, not yet. <laughs> Um, I think before we open it up to questions, I think maybe you, Maria was going to read another small passage. Sure. Um, yeah, so I'll just end with a small passage now from the last chapter of the book, which is called Sweet, Sour, and Bitter, um, just to give you an idea of, you know, how the book sort of arcs back to uh, Bangladesh. So it starts off with my childhood in Bangladesh, and then um, I go off to the U.S. And the, the scene I've picked uh, from this chapter is actually a scene where I've returned for a, a visit to Bangladesh um, many years after, after living in the U.S. As an adult, I've returned. Um, and my family and I, um, along with my, my first husband um, and one of my uh, other friends, we've actually, um, we're actually on a visit to my father's hometown. And... Um, this passage has a lot of underlying sort of tension and significance beyond the obvious because um, I'm realizing in this passage that, you know, um, in this scene, I'm realizing that, you know, I've come all this way sort of full circle, so to speak, and I'm really not any closer to any kind of reconciliation or peace, so to speak. I took Alan and Yamin to see the Smoky Mountains of Silet, along with the rest of my family. We rented a quaint bungalow on a tea estate, surrounded by acres of garden. In the evenings, we played card games around a fire. Sometimes, when I peered at the darkness beyond the windows, invaded only by a flicker of a flyer f firefly, I let myself imagine I was back in Bagbari, and father was in the next room, reading his newspaper. Deer skins and stuffed tiger heads, not unlike the ones in my paternal grandfather's house, hung above us in watchful silence. The mornings were more lucid, leaving less room for imagination. Yamin wandered off in his own, on his own, hauling his tripod on his shoulders. Yamin was my first husband. Yes. I knew that the photographs he took would end up in one of the brown cardboard boxes in his bedroom, next to thousands of other pictures he had taken during his travels. With his numerous cameras, he tried to capture and freeze a beauty that escaped the normal lens of his vision. In my presence, he maintained a reproachful distance, never asking for anything, as if to say that he had no interest in the world that he suspected would soon reclaim me into its depths. But every once in a while, he emerged from his sullenness and made a feeble attempt to make himself known. Interesting place, he'd say, but I can't see you here anymore. Need I tell him that I didn't see me at all? 
Though I had never hoped for the fervor of our time together in Amagansett or New York, a part of me was startled by the aloofness with which my friend and former lover, Alan, regarded me while in Bangladesh, the place he had been so eager to share with me. I played the polite host, and he was the gracious guest, as we had been during his first visits to Thorn Street. Yet he got along superbly with my mother. Just as Alan had guessed, it was as if they had always known each other. My mother couldn't imagine a wonderful man like Alan was not married with children. That, to her, was even more perplexing than my own shabby attempt at domesticity. One morning, I woke up to find Alan sitting in the garden, staring into the distance. From the way he held his body, arched and beseeching, I knew he was deep in prayer. I watched him for a few minutes, then called out his name. He turned quickly, and for a minute, I saw in his sunken eyes the dead weight of remorse. Seeing Alan like that broke me in much the same way as loving him had kept me together, quietly, irreversibly. On our last day in Silet, Alan approached me on the open balcony where I was watching the afternoon diffuse into a purple light. My brother and Yamin had gone into town and mother and my sister Naveen were resting in their rooms. I wanted to thank you, Alan said, smiling sadly. What for? I tried to smile back. I've been meaning to tell you that this place is full of magic. I've never been anywhere like this and I've never been so inspired to pray. What did you pray for? I asked, knowing that he wanted me to. I prayed for you, he said unhesitatingly. I prayed for us to find happiness. I stared at him. Had he really not known, had he not felt the pure joy when we were together in the candlelit rooms of Amagansett, that flickering light, a deceptive testament to the raging fire in our hearts? What else was needed to give happiness its legitimate credit? What blessing was required, and in which God's name, to turn shame into love and grief into bliss? And what of those who never find themselves face to face with God? Does their love amount to nothing? Are they forever suspended between love and its sanctification? But I began to understand, truly, why Alan was so drawn to my history, my love, my life, and why we had ever been together. He perceived, somewhere in, his, in its tangle, his own piteous need to be judged, punished, and finally forgiven before he could feel free to pursue his own. And it dawned on me why Mother and Alan were so fond of each other. The storm had subsided, and the rain now comes at a slower, steadier pace. The blue light around us begins to clear. But I don't know if I have any more clarity than I did before. Um, I wanted to ask if anyone in the audience had any questions. Congratulations, Maria. Thank for you. For having your work published by a world uh, sort of a publishing company. I'm from Melbourne. My name is Peter Lim. Uh, just to share a few thoughts uh, with people. I'm very lucky to be here because I'm on holiday. And suddenly here is the first of, uh, you know, creativity. First of all, congratulations, you know. Thank you. I think every story is interesting. There are very few stories that are not interesting. Now, I think Melanie has... Uh, already aptly said this, that why do you want to use the word absolute truth? It is up to the reader to decide. The reader is a very intelligent creature. He or she will know what is truth and what is not truth. So why do you really use this subtitle? I'm not criticizing, it's just in my head, you know, why do you want to use that absolute truth? When you say that there's no such thing as truth, you see. Well, I think uh, for the purposes of discussion, we just wanted to bring it up um, to clarify that there is no such thing. Um, one of the most common questions I get um, regarding my book is, is it really true? Did it really happen? Are you sure that this, this happened? Um, 
So I, I think it's a natural question. Um, I, think, uh, I think people pick up memoirs because they want to read something that's true, um, that they think is true. Um, and I think it's a, it's a fair um, question to ask, you know, exactly what kind of them. truth. I will leave it to them to tickle their imagination. Because yes, and we eventually yeah. do. So, yeah. 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 Uh, anyway, I'm a sort of a struggling writer. I self-published two books in the Melbourne because I have nothing to do. You know, I'm retired. I'm 75 years old. I'm a musician. I'm an opera singer and so on. So I have nothing to do. So I wrote just for fun, you see. So my first book, I just want to share this with you, then coming back to the subject proper. But I don't take too much time because the other, other uh, people would like to speak, you see. So my first book was a Dialogue on Love, What is Love, where I was the main contributor. And I went to the city of Melbourne to talk to young people, talk to old people. And then I gathered a lot of stories, and it came out as a book. You see. It's in, in this uh, uh, in the internet, you can read it. My second book was published uh, a few months ago called uh, The Heart Has Its Reasons, a collection of poems, you see. But now I come to sharing something with you because uh, uh, I am writing my memoir as you do, but I am writing for the sake of my family. I'm 75, I might die any time. My book is growing up in British Malaya, 1940 to 1975. So I do struggle with this uh, thing about telling the truth. So how do I solve this dilemma really? How do I solve it? Now, as far as memory is concerned, and you are quite right, as we go through memory lane, there are many things that are very blur. And as we look through that, we tend to romanticize something for the benefit of ourselves because we want to tickle the reader or to make our to make a, a book more interesting. That is why I'm trying to avoid not to romanticize or to sort of uh, make myself more important, more clever, that kind of thing. I struggle with that all the time because a memoir can be a terrible thing because I, 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 and people say, ah, oh, shut up, we tell you, we don't want to hear from you. So I struggle with that. Uh, but ultimately, my last point is this, that am I being true to myself? Because I'm leaving this document with my two sons, my grandson and my wife and so on. So that is a test that uh, I have to ask myself. And if I'm not true to myself, perhaps I will sort of uh, have failed myself and so on. So my book ends by saying that um, it's only 150 to 200 pages. It's called the Growing Up in British Malaya. There are many things I've done in my life. There are also many other things I've not done. There are many things I've regretted. There are all... There are also many things that I wish I have not been done. There are many, thing, many incidents where I hope I have been kinder. But I'm human like anybody else. Well, thank All, you, sir. Yeah. Okay, thank you Good luck to you, sir. Time for the others. You. So maybe the ladies over there. Thank you very much. Thank you for sharing. That's a very good interaction, right? Okay. <laughs> Leave the time for the ladies over there. The ladies there. Well, I'm sorry, I haven't read your book, but uh, I'm really curious oh, when you talk about the sense of homelessness, is that resolved? No. No. Oh, no. Good. It's I think not, good. It, yeah, I think here, that's what I came to understand, yeah. that it's yeah. not really something that you resolve or need to resolve. Well, I have this sense that I need to resolve Yes, that sense yeah, will also... I feel like I'm uprooted from everywhere. Well, anyway, I'm going to read your book and Thank find you. out. Thank you. Please do. Thank you very much. Any more questions? Um, um, just regarding uh, the absolute truth thing, I absolutely agree with you by because um, I don't think there is absolute truth. Um, but recently, I read a book about like how storytelling and memra that there is um, a right to saying this that actually memra or even autobiography, um, they should be put on the fiction shelf because most of them, I mean, they are not actually fabricated, as you mentioned, it's imaginative. But um, it's really true that they are not the absolute whole truth. So what do you think about that? And in a sense, that writer put forward and by saying that um, maybe the writer of memoir or you know, autobiography, fiction, they tend to put themselves as like the hero of the whole story of their life and then to deliberately also add tension, climax, 
and stir up to their own life, making the whole um, memoir and fiction more like you know those normal novel. So, what do you think about that? And question number two: that is, is there any particular theme that you want to bring out through your own memoir? I think that um, I'm not too sure that autobiography and fiction can be lumped together. Um, I, as I said, autobiography does tend to be pretty factual uh, to the point that's possible and um, not so objective. So, um, I, I, yeah. So I think autobiographies, you know, do sort of tend to uh, be quite um, far, 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 farther away from um, from fiction. I think memoirs. I mean. I, Sure, I, I wouldn't mind if it was in the same cell, shelf as the novel. It'd probably sell more because <laughs> you have to go to a completely different section in the bookstore. Um, uh, yeah, I think for all the reasons that we already talked about, the, novel, the novelistic uh, aspect of memoir, the fact that it's a um, story based on truth, but it's stylized truth, and it's uh, how you remember it. Your, asp your interpretation comes into it, not just how you remember it, but how you interpret it. Um, so I think memoir is right in between autobiography and novel. It's a very interesting genre. And it doesn't really matter if it's in the fiction shelf or not, but it is very close to fiction in the, in the way it's written, not in the content, but in the, in the style. Yeah. Thank you. Any questions? Hi, I'm Rebecca. Um, I'm pursuing my master's in creative nonfiction right now in Hong Kong. And I guess my question is, did you study fiction or nonfiction? And the reason I ask is because Creative nonfiction is a relatively new genre, and I find that we're learning completely different things than my fiction classmates. And so the fact that you've employed kind of fiction strategies to the memoir, um, I'm, I'm trying to understand if you're approaching it from kind of like a fiction foundation or more of a nonfiction approach. Um, and I just wanted to comment that a lot of what we learn in creative nonfiction is about... Um, it takes a certain level of introspection to be able to write something that's not just about your life, but appealing to appealing to the reader as a universal theme. And um, I, I really enjoyed the level of wisdom and introspection that from the two passages that you read. So thank you. I you know the the program I went to a low residency program, um, low residency MFA program in the U.S. and um, uh, luckily, we we didn't have to uh, sort of study one genre or another. We had to pick a genre for the final thesis, um, which was this book for me. But um, as far as, you know, uh, studying went or taking classes went or concentrations, we sort of did everything, you know. I particularly um, did fiction and creative nonfiction. I didn't do a lot of poetry or, or um, dramatic writing for that matter. But I did a lot of fiction, yes. And I did a lot of creative nonfiction. And I think that's probably the reason why I ended up with a memoir, because both affected me, both have influenced me, and I really love both genres. Um, so for me, it doesn't really... Uh, make any sense to sort of limit myself to just a fiction uh, writer or a writer of creative nonfiction or to study just one or the other. I think you just need to do, I think you need to pick a genre when you actually write a book. But um, other than that, you know, it's, and, and even when you're writing a book, you're writing it in a certain genre because you have to, but there's so many things that come in from other genres all the time. Thank you. Um. This lady in grey wants to ask questions. Thank you. Um, so how do you like Hong Kong so far? And how has Hong Kong shaped you um, as a writer and as a craft, craftsman of words? You know, how do you like Hong Kong? How, you know, things like that. Thank you. I really like Hong Kong, which is why, you know, I have made no attempt to, to move uh, as of yet. And I'm probably going to be here for a few more years. Um, I really like Hong Kong. And um, I think that, um, you know, Hong Kong reminds me a lot of Bangladesh in many ways. It's a very busy metropolis. Um, it's very multicultural. It's, um, 
the, you know, the, the Chinese way of life, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't speak the language and I don't understand Chinese very well, but um, I can completely understand that the, the, the cultural norms are very similar to the kind of cultural norms I grew up with, the family expectations, um, the family dynamics, uh, the way, you know, uh, people grow up, they were the, from how, how they behave in public, the way they talk, their uh, responses to situations. All, th th these are all things I'm already familiar with. So Hong Kong to me feels like a very familiar place, you know. Uh, I, now I'm familiar with life in New York because I've lived there for 10 years. But when I first went there, I felt this huge sense of alienation. But I never felt that in Hong Kong. And I didn't, I felt even more alienated when I moved to Japan, for instance. Um, that's a whole different world. <laughs> a very fascinating world, but you know, it's just not something you can relate to easily. But I don't feel that way about Hong Kong, even though I admit that you know, I haven't made the effort to learn Chinese um, very well. Um, it feels very familiar and feels close to my heart. Any more questions? Lady in black. Hi, thank you so much for sharing with us. Um, my name is Christina. Um, I wanted to talk to you about, or ask you about the topic of fear, um, because I mean, we're in general in society, most people fear introspection. So for a memoirist to actually go there, um, but there's also fear of offense. And in so much of your memoir, I mean, you use the word piteous to describe um, your ex-lover, Alan, you know. Um, do you, is, is that a struggle that you had when you were writing your memoir? Um, just fear of offending other people that were part of your life and how they might treat you after they read what you really think. And also fear of going into some places that you might not be so comfortable with. Yes, yes to both, absolutely. Um, you know, I already told Melanie how I, my mother reacted. And um, yeah, I had that fear um, with regards to my, my family, the, the, the other characters uh, that are outside of the family that came into, into play. Um, but, y you know, I really, I mean, I think you can, um, I don't know how else to put it, but if you write or if you're interested in writing or if you start the writing process, you really do come to a place um, and ho hopefully you come to that place where the, the writing matters more than anything else. And it really does help you with your fears. I wouldn't say the fears go away. They're there, you know. Um, my family never comes to my readings or my, well, they're not here now, but even when I've done them in Bangladesh or elsewhere where they were there, they don't really come. And it's not that they don't want to or I don't want them to, but we don't really talk about it. I don't insist, they don't insist. There's like this invisible wall. And it's probably because this is a memoir and not some novel about... I don't know, watermelons and typhoons. So, you know, it's, it's, it's the content of this book. It makes everybody uncomfortable. It is extremely introspective. Um, but that's what I wanted to do. Any more questions? Lady in pink. Um, two questions. One, how has the book been received in Bangladesh? And two, uh, since it's a memoir, um, have you felt comfortable dropping incidents which might actually be uncomfortable to write about because it's not an autobiography. You don't have to write everything. Mm -hmm. So have you actually deliberately left certain things out because you felt uncomfortable writing about them? And also, have you had the need to change the names of other characters? So the incident itself might be true, but just so as to not embarrass someone or make you know, people object to your book, have you had the need to disguise other people? Um, the book has been received actually very well in Bangladesh. Um, I attended the, the Hay Festival in Bangladesh last year, a few months after the book came out, uh, which is a very big English literary festival that now happens in Bangladesh, has been happening there for the last three to four years. And I was, uh, you know, very actually pleasantly surprised by the level of enthusiasm and interest. And I think that's partly also because this is actually a very interesting time for English writing in Bangladesh. Um, as I said, I published my excerpt in the English literary journal there that um, has uh, come into existence. Um, 
so all these things are happening in Bang happening in Bangladesh. People, there are there's a whole uh, contingent of of really good English writing writers that have um, come out of Bangladesh in the last, I would say, five years. So um, I think I'm lucky to have, you know, sort of published at a time like this where there is a very strong interest. So I was lucky in that sense as well. The book was uh, has sold well in Bangladesh and done well in Bangladesh. Um, as for the the second part of your question, yes, I changed all the names. All the names are fictional. So that's, you know, that's that. Um, have I left out um, things? Uh, if I have, it's only because, you know, as I said, you have to follow a narrative arc. You have to follow, it has to be, a, it has to read like a story um, or else it would just be a bunch of personal essays, so to speak. Um, so in order for the story to make sense, there are certain things you have to leave out. But I don't think I've left anything out because it was particularly difficult to write about it. I may have, um, I may have stylized it in a sense that, um, you know, made it more appropriate for that particular chapter or topic. Uh, but mostly if I left anything out, it was because it didn't make sense in a narrative way. Uh, but not because it was hard to, because I think I've already written enough things that were hard enough to write about. <laughs> Thank you. Gentlemen over there. Hi, thank you, uh, and thank you for this evening. But um, just picking up on the title of tonight, tonight's talk, something we haven't spoken about is, is imagery. And in terms of creating this art, creating a, a, a coherent piece, how have you employed imagery, and, and what purpose do you think it's served in, in putting the book together? Right. Um, yeah, so we, I think we touched a little bit upon it, but yes, um, I think imagery, again, is pr basically the main novelistic tr technique that comes into memoir. It's really what you play with uh, the most um, uh, and what you need to play with the most because imagery is what really leaves your memory. You remember the event, you remember how it made you feel, you remember the people, but it's always hard to remember the exact imagery. For example, you know, how, what the weather was like outside, what the lighting was like in the room, what may have been the exact color of your clothes. So that's where really the imagination comes in. Um, and I've done that with most of the scenes in the, because I'm pretty sure I, you know, You were recurring? No, that I, I didn't use recurring um, images, no. Is there any more? Um, Thank you. Looking forward to reading the book. Um, I wanted to ask about your MFA and, and whether you think you would have written the book whether you, if you'd done it or not. Um, did that give you <laughs> enough structure? I mean, I, I've yeah. kind of been in a situation where I've applied for, been accepted, then decided not to do it, just for the ideas that, oh, maybe I can just do it by myself. I don't know how, how you felt about that tension of, you know, being taught how to write or whether you, you, you could just go with your own intentions on it. What I'll say is that you certainly don't need an MFA to write a book, and that's not why I did it either. Um, and um, also, I think in most MFAs, especially, especially so in, in low residency programs, and Melanie can attest to that as well, you're not exactly taught how to write. It's sort of like a, a guiding uh, framework for you to, uh, I don't know, maybe decide on exactly what kind of writer you want to be, what are some of the genres you want to concentrate on, that sort of thing, really. Um, for me, um, it served the purpose of having some focused time, because that's what I was struggling with at that time in my life. Um, I had always wanted to write, um, or at least I had wanted to write for a long time before this book came out. And um, I was already starting to have some definitive idea of where it was going to go, but I just didn't have the discipline or the focus to sit down and do it. 
Um, I had just moved to a different country. So it was all very, um, I, I really needed that focus and I needed that time. And that's what it provided for me. And I think that's what it provides for most people if you allow it to. So that is very important. But in terms of being taught to write, you, I mean, you certainly can't be taught to write a book, that's for sure. Thank you. So any more questions from the floor? Yes. Please pass her the microphone. I just wanted to ask, what was your writing routine like? I mean, did you sit down every day at a fixed time and, you know, get so many pages done? Or was it just when you felt like it? Uh, how regular were you? Yeah, well, when I was in grad school, um, it was, you know, a lot of reading and a lot of writing. And I did that every day because I had to, you know, you have assignments and all that. So the school routine is a little bit different. But I don't really see that as when I really wrote my memoir because there were so many other things I was doing. So the real work actually came once I uh, was signed by my publisher. And then I had one year to get the book together. And um, it was very difficult. Uh, I was sort of in my early years in Hong Kong and I had just, my, my son was 18 months old. Um, so yes, I had to, I had to discipline. I'm usually not very disciplined about writing um, in, in the sense that I, I do try to write a certain number of hours a week, but I change the days around. I change the hours around. That's just how I work. But during the book, um, the writing of the book, I stuck to a certain number of days. I stuck to a certain number of hours because I had deadlines and I had a very, I had a lovely editor who was uh, not very lovely about timelines. So, <laughs> yeah, so I had to do that. Okay. Any more questions? Okay. Um, I read the book and it's, it's very, very nice and very interesting. And uh, as a mother as well, it's very difficult to pick up a book and finish it. So, um, in your book, I, maybe because I could relate to most of the stuff there, so maybe that's what um, spiked up the interest. But other than that, I, I felt it was an interesting book. So, when you were writing it, did you um, keep that in mind, like what would the um, people reading it, what do they want to hear? Is that one of the things that was in your mind when you were writing it? Or was it just, oh, let me just write what I feel I want to put on the book? Because what I see is that mostly people write memoir uh, because they want to relate what they remember and what they want to uh, have put back when they, you know, they, they pick it up and they, they want other people to know about their life. But your book... Um, a lot of that was that too, but there was also uh, the fiction part of it, which made it so interesting, because other memoirs I've picked up and I've left. <laughs> so that way, you know, yeah. So did you think like that when you were writing? Um, yes and no. I, I mean, I think as when you write something, you always have to think about the elephant in the room. That's the reader, the reader that you don't see, but that you're writing it for. But... At the same time, you can't just write for a reader because then it would just all be so contrived. Um, I think the, the struggle or the challenge was to write what I wanted to write, which is what I essentially did, but to find a story in all of those memories and in all of the things that I wanted to to enhance and portray a story that would make sense universally to everyone, you know, um, because I didn't want this to be a memoir that's just sort of relevant to a Bangladeshi or a Muslim or an American. I wanted it to be a, something that's universally understandable and relatable. And I think that's something I did keep in mind as I structured the book and as I uh, formulated the storyline more so than um, just what the reader wants to hear. Thank Does that you. make sense? Any more questions? Mm, one Chinese writer once said that it's easy, it's always so easy for him to be overly imaginative when he trying when he was trying to uh, write a memoir. No matter it, uh, no matter when he tries to um, memorize his own life or some other people's life. But when he came to 
and try to write a fiction or novel, it's always not so easy to be and um, have enough imagination or inspiration. Will that happen to you? Uh, if so, if so, what will you do to deal with that? Thank you. I hope it doesn't happen to me. Um, I don't know, but I do believe that you know, you, uh, like I said, when you start to write something, when you start a work, whether it's fiction or nonfiction, um, you, you know, the main thing to understand is what are, what what is your story. You can't just start writing without a story. I mean, you can if it's a newspaper article, or even then you have to have some sort of story in there. But I think you, what you need to understand or what you need to start out with is a story. And once you have the story, the imagination will come in. So I think that if you don't have a story, then uh, you don't have anything to write at the moment, you know, um, which often happens to me, by the way. But I think once you have the story, you, have, you worry less about the imagination. Thank That's you, the first step. So anybody has questions for Maria? So no. Um, I think some of you might wish to talk to Maria privately after this, uh, the seminar. So you're also welcome to do so. So um, maybe let's give them a big hand for the wonderful sharing. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you so much, Thank Maria, you, and also uh, Melanie. And uh, actually, we've also got uh, an autograph session. So if you guys have uh, Maria's book, uh, you're welcome to line up in the center aisle for autographs. So if you haven't, actually we have a um, cent uh, counter outside the room, right outside the room there so that you can buy Maria's book. So uh, thank you so much for coming. And on behalf of the HKTDC, I hope you all enjoy the visit to the book fair.